like me to talk about some of the uh, clinical trials? That would be great. Yeah. And that's the most important level of evidence. Um, you know, we have all different levels of evidence. We have like Petri dish models. That's one level of evidence in cell cultures. We have animal model level of evidence. And then we have human evidence. And that's, you can divide that roughly into two broad categories. The category we just talked about, epidemiology. And then the second category would be clinical trials. And so um, that's when you, when you actually give a compound to patients. You don't observe um, people who happen to be taking it anyways. You know, usually you see these patients in the office and you prescribe it for them and you follow them over time. The best level of evidence is called a randomized control trial. And so in this study, in this design, which is kind of the gold standard way we determine if a therapy is effective, is you get a group of patients with a condition, you randomly assign them to either uh, therapy or to usually a placebo, which is a inactive therapy, inactive pill. And it's randomized and double blind. So we're double masked. Everybody, you know, the patients don't know what they're receiving. The study team doesn't know what they're receiving. You follow them over time and you see on different outcome measures, are they, are they doing better? Statistically, significantly better than those on the placebo. And if you show that, if you can show that the patients randomly assigned to the therapy are doing significantly better um, than patients randomized to a placebo, that is the highest level of evidence to prove that a therapy is effective. We always like it when we can replicate such data. So we have two studies or three studies from different groups that show the same thing. We have more confidence that way that, you know, maybe it wasn't just a fluke, this first study. But what I was amazed to discover when I started my journey in reading about lithium is that there already were two published randomized controlled trials showing statistically significant benefit of low dose lithium in treating and helping with cognition and patients with Alzheimer's disease, as well as in patients with a pre Alzheimer's disease condition called mild cognitive impairment. Both of these studies were performed in Brazil by two different groups, but both were, you know, this trial design, uh, randomized control trial, placebo control, double blind. Um, that's amazing that this very inexpensive therapy that we've been using you know in the united states since 1970 as a fda approved treatment and in other countries well before that for treating bipolar disorder we're very familiar with this compound and these researchers were using um a very low dose uh, dose is a big part of what i talk about in the book dose is a critical factor to establish what is the optimal dose um, before you conduct these studies. Um, if you choose too high of a dose, you'll have unacceptable toxicities and patients will withdraw from a study. If you choose too low of a dose, you'll likely not give yourself a chance to show benefit. So the dosing is key with lithium. And um, the researchers, the first study, they chose a dose about half of what you would give patients with bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder patients, they take about 300 milligrams a day of elemental lithium um, in order to treat bipolar disorder. The dose that was used by the first uh, study in Brazil, they used a dose of about 150 milligrams a day. And it was very well tolerated in patients with this pre-Alzheimer's condition. And they showed significant improvement in cognition as well as uh, biomarker improvement in uh, this protein in the cerebral spinal fluid, one of these sticky proteins called phosphor phosphorylated tau, it significantly reduced levels of P tau in the cerebral spinal fluid in the patients on lithium compared to placebo. So both cognitive improvement as well as um, biomarker improvement in that first study. There was a reduced rate of conversion from mild cognitive impairment to Alzheimer's disease, but the study was very, very small and that did not reach statistical significance, but just numerically it was a reduced rate of conversion. The second study, so the first study used a dose of 150 milligrams. The second study used a dose of 0.3 milligrams, 0.3 milligrams, which ironically, 
or interestingly, I should say, is the same dose that a pack per day smoker would be getting exposed to if, from inhaling lithium from what we have determined is probably the average amount of lithium in, in a cigarette. The amount of lithium in, in uh, tobacco kind of varies based on the strain and where in the world it's grown. But um, probably about 0.3 milligrams is what a pack per day smoker is going to be absorbing from inhaling the smoke. Mm -hmm. This study by the other group in Brazil using 0.3 milligrams a day in patients with early Alzheimer's disease showed amazingly a complete stability of cognition just based on this one cognitive um, outcome called the MMSE compared to the placebo arm. And this was a year and a half study, you know, went almost a year and a half. It was like 15 months, I believe. Um, and the Alzheimer's group, their MMSC scores stayed completely stable from baseline out to 15 months. And the placebo arm, as predicted, their, their MMSC scores continued to worsen over time. And there was a statistically significant difference between the two treatment arms just after three months. And, and that, that difference continued to um, increase over time, progressively increase. So, I mean, that uh, there is a figure in the book depicting the data from that um, that, that study using 0.3 milligrams a day. You just look at that figure. And when I looked at that figure from the original paper, I thought, how can this be? This is, this is way too good to be true. How come everybody is not talking about this? You know, we need these studies to be replicated. We need more, more research, um, but it's a pretty darn good start. You, uh, there are a couple of ongoing trials. So, you know, for a number of reasons that you go into the book that uh, we probably don't want to delve in now, you know, it's it's difficult to get the attention on lithium. Um, but there is some work going on right now. There is, uh, I saw there was the Lattice trial and um, and you're, you are doing some trials at the University at uh, Buffalo as well. Could, could you talk about how far you've, you've got in your trials and it, are they open label? Can you look at any results yet? Yes. So um, our study, we we're finally, after I submitted 17 grant applications, trying to get funding to do a variety of different lithium studies, mostly in Parkinson's disease, I finally was able to get a very small grant to do a, a open label pilot clinical trial was kind of a dose finding biomarker study. So we started that um, back in 2019. The pandemic kind of set us back a little bit in terms of enrollment, but um, we had enough funding to enroll 19 patients. They were, the patients were randomly assigned to one of three different doses of lithium because we really weren't, weren't quite sure what was going to be, you know, the best lithium to the best dose to look at in future studies. So that was one um purpose of this pilot study and also to try and see what were the best biomarker outcome measures it was a short study patients were randomly assigned one of these three doses for six months so it's too short of a of a study to be able to see is there improvement in clinical outcomes you know patients motor symptoms or cognitive symptoms again these are patients with parkinson's disease not alzheimer's disease that we studied and uh but biomarkers, there is a chapter in the book devoted to biomarkers. There's, there's just so key towards our um, ability to identify effective treatments, um, ways to slow the disease. Um, you know, and the best biomarkers are going to be neuroimaging biomarkers. You know, these are brain disorders, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. The most logical biomarkers are neuroimaging studies that reflect this progressive damage that occurs in the brain. You know, if we could see that a therapy was slowing the damage in the brain, that would be pretty powerful. Most importantly, we need to show that these therapies improve patient symptoms over time. But, you know, those are much larger studies and much long-term studies. We can design short-term studies like the one we did in Buffalo and look at biomarkers, see if, see if these therapies engage these biomarkers. We also looked at blood-based biomarkers as well. So um, we presented these findings at um, a movement disorder meeting uh, this past fall that was in Madrid. 
um, just as a poster. And the full length manuscript is currently um, under review right now. So that hasn't hasn't been accepted. It hasn't been published, but hopefully that will be soon. Um, I can just tell you, I mean, the results that we presented in the poster was improvement in the blood-based biomarkers. The biomarkers that we found it engaged were NER1 and SAD1. I won't get into the details about what these are, but they're uh, kind of neuroprotective proteins. And we found a, a big increase in the expression in white, peripheral white blood cells. We also, in a subset of these patients, were able to look at neuroimaging and um, a particular assessment called free water in the brain. Several groups, our group, a group at University of Florida, other groups um, have shown that free water progressively increases in the brain in Parkinson's disease and reflects worsening of um, symptoms over time. So it is um, believed to be a valid disease progression biomarker. So if a therapy could slow the progression of free water over time in these specific brain sites, that would pretty strongly suggest that this therapy is protecting these brain cells and it would be very promising to be able to slow the progression, the clinical progression, the progression of symptoms in patients over time and improve their prognosis. And so, you know, we haven't, that, that's what's in this paper that's, that's under review. You know, all I can say is we were pretty excited about what we found in the uh, um, free water assessments, but it is also important to realize that this is a very small study and the free water results is just a subset of those 19 patients. So um, it's very preliminary, but fortunately we are able now to get another small grant. And so we are gonna be increasing, um, basically expanding the study that we already did and enroll more patients, somewhere between 15 to 30 additional patients. We received funding from one source, it looks like we're gonna receive funding from another source, hopefully. And so that, that study is going to open up in the spring. Hopefully the second study will replicate what we found in the first study. So, you know, that's what we've been doing in Buffalo in Parkinson's disease. Um, it's, it's very preliminary, you know, it's early, but it is um, showing target engagement um, of these biomarkers, which is extremely important. The, the Latisse trial that you mentioned so I don't, I, I don't know if they pronounce it Latisse or Lat, <laughs> but it's at the University of Pittsburgh. It's L-A-T-T-I-C-E. Yeah. So basically all I know for, about this trial is what anybody can see if you go to the website clinicaltrials.gov and you can read about the trial design, but has been funded by um, the National Institutes of Health, the uh, main you know, public source of uh, research funding in the, in the U.S., um, so that, that's great news right there, that they were able to attract the attention of um, the NIH to get funded. They're going to enroll 80 patients um, with this pre-Alzheimer's condition called mild cognitive impairment, randomly assign them to lithium or to a placebo. And they're looking, and patients are going to be in the study for two years. So, you know, a, a good duration study. And they're going to look at their cognitive symptoms. You know, are the patients on lithium? have a slower progression and cognitive decline. You know, there's a cognition preserved <laughs> compared to the placebo arm. But also importantly, they're looking at uh, blood-based biomarkers and MRI biomarkers. Um, so it's really a great study design in every sense, except for one thing, which I'm a little worried about, is that the dose that they chose is kind of on the high side. Earlier studies in Alzheimer's disease they made this mistake. Actually, early studies in Parkinson's disease with lithium made the mistake of assuming that the lithium dose that was going to have the greatest potential to show benefit in Alzheimer's or Parkinson's was the same dose that is known to be effective for bipolar disorder patients. And that is proven to be completely incorrect. If you use that high dose that what I mentioned earlier, you know, 300 milligrams a day of elemental lithium, patients with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, they don't tolerate it at all. You get a huge number of withdrawals from the study. You know, patients just, they can't take it. Their, their side effects are way too high and they have to withdraw from the study. And when patients withdraw 
from a clinical study, it just, it makes it very difficult to interpret the results. Um, mm. It's often what we call a failed trial. It just fails to be able to answer the underlying question, is lithium effective for treating the disease? If you have half the patients withdraw from the study, you're not gonna be able to answer that under, you know, that fundamental question. So, you know, based on the poor tolerability of the high dose lithium, that's why the Brazilian researchers chose such lower doses. And their studies were, as we already talked about, were positive studies. They did show significant improvement in these symptoms. So the dose that um, the University of Pittsburgh researchers have chosen is, is, is kind of on the high side. So I'm a little concerned that they might have some poor tolerability. We're going to have to wait and see. Mm-hmm. I certainly hope I'm wrong. I hope the patients tolerate it very well and they stay in the study for the full two years. But it's definitely encouraging that, um, you know, a, a larger Alzheimer's disease study, MCI study has been funded and is ongoing. Those results are probably going to be, I think, late 2024 or 2025 is when they're going to be announced. Mm-hmm. The outcome of the successful, if we get successful trials, would be that like the FDA would approve lithium for use in Alzheimer's and, and Parkinson's. I mean, but can the FDA suggest that people take supplements or or that it has to be like a drug that they take? Yeah, so that's a good point as to distinguish between the um, medication pharmaceutical uh, arena and the -the over-the-counter dietary supplements, vitamins, minerals uh, arena. These are two different, I guess, just entities and certainly are viewed quite differently by the FDA. So starting with that first category, to get a medication FDA approved, you know, whether it's in the US by the Food and Drug Administration or in Europe um, or in Canada, every single organ, you know, area of the country has its own regulatory body that reviews the data. And it is a, a very expensive process. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. Um, that typically is just um, an undertaking by the pharmaceutical industry. You know, it's it, it really, you need a, quite a bit of funding. Even if it's a repurposed medication like lithium, you know, not a new chemical compound, but an old compound, even when you're dealing with an old compound, you're probably looking uh, somewhere in the 30 to $50 million range to perform the clinical trials and submit the application to get formal FDA approval for the medication. But, you know, you mentioned, say the Latisse trial is positive um, and it shows great improvement in the biomarkers and the MRIs. It shows great improvement in patients' cognition. Um, You know, so it's kind of replicating these Brazilian studies. So now we have three randomized controlled trials you know, wouldn't that be a great boon for patients with Alzheimer's or this pre-Alzheimer's condition? The answer is yes, it would. But doctors would have to prescribe lithium off-label. You know, it's not FDA approved, it's available, um, but doctors would need to feel comfortable enough with the data and the evidence that they would prescribe it for their patients. That's very much a individual physician to patient interaction um, in terms of whether or not you know, that, that is actually that prescribing is going to occur. Um, you know, off-label use is, is something that occurs all the time. It's great that lithium is very inexpensive. So it's not like you're going to get a lot of pushback from, you know, insurance companies, you know, in the U S we have private insurance companies that they don't like it. If you're <laughs> trying to prescribe a very expensive medication for a patient off-label, but an inexpensive medication, they don't care at all. Um, they'll be fine. Uh, if you feel like it has reasonable amount of evidence that it that it's effective and that it's safe. Um, so if the Latisse trial is positive, yeah, there probably will be a bump in the use of lithium, the prescription use of lithium for um, treating Alzheimer's patients.